question. Okay, my name is Franco Bonafé. I work at the Max Planck Institute of, uh, for the Structural Dynamics of Matter in Hamburg. In this session, I will tell you the excited states part two. So the other method that Thomas uh, also mentioned uh, briefly yesterday, uh, this development in the FTB plus has been done since the year 2016 when I visited Bremen for the first time and there with the help of Balint, mostly we could, uh, and Christian Sanchez, of course, who was my PhD supervisor, we could get these features into the code. Uh, and now Charlie, who is also here, will uh, give the practical session later. So the, the real tutorial part. Uh, and, um, and yeah, we're working on new features and uh, hope it's useful for you. Um, so basically the main, most of the contents of the talk are summarized in this JCTC paper in case uh, you are interested in some more details that I don't mention. Uh, but let me just get started. So basically, fortunately for us, Thomas Nichols already did a great introduction yesterday to all the topics, so I don't need to say much. Thank you. It will be a short talk and we can get more to the hands-on. Uh, but basically, you know, all, every, all processes related to light matter interactions are relevant for many purposes. You have there a few examples. But uh, light matter interaction from a quantum point of view is a complicated problem. Yes, it depends on the degree of, of accuracy or the level of theory that you want to, to tackle. The origin is, is always non-relativistic quantum electrodynamics. This is the theory that couples light and matter, basically. Uh, but if you, then you have to make approximations, right? Uh, in, the, in the approximations, you can decide whether you want to treat uh, light in a quantum way or in a classical way. Uh, that would be what's called semi-classical dynamics. And you have to fix a gauge. Yeah? You have to pick a gauge, for example, the Coulomb gauge or the length gauge. You have to pick an approximation for the cap for the coupling in the multiple expansion, for example, whether you make dipole coupling, quadrupole coupling, octopole coupling, magnetic dipole. You have to in include nuclear motion or not. I mean, it's a it's the vast universe. So that's why we start with the very basic or the most approximate way. And then on top, we can add corrections or we can try to compare with other theories. As an example, I put here a Hamiltonian that includes the quantum uh, the quantum uh, light degrees of freedom, so photons degrees of freedom in the, the third term over there. Yes. Um, and then, of course, a, a, a dipole coupling in this term. This is not this is not what we will do, of course, but just to mention that you can you can try to go as far as possible in order to describe some uh, processes of light matter interaction that are normally not included or not not present in in the in the basic uh, the, or or the or the most approximate way. Yes. So just as a reminder, of course, I will not say too much about this. Just go and click there on the lecture by Thomas to see why uh, and how time-dependent DFT is derived or where's the origin. So basically, you, as you mentioned yesterday, after the Hohenberg and Kohn theorems for uh, DFT and the Kohn-Sham method, then Runge Gross had their theorem or their, uh, yeah, uh, let's say, contribution in which they show that it's also possible to do the DFT, so basically the fact that the energy of the system is a function of the density also in time. Yes, this holds in time, for which you need, uh, of course, you need to write everything in a time dependent way. And now you can also, you, a hard tree potential in time, in time domain is no problem. Then you also have this exchange correlation potential in time domain, which is a problem because uh, you, first of all, we don't have an exact exchange correlation potential and then on top of that, you need to account for the memory of the system and the time in, in, a, in a exchange correlation potential that depends on the previous times. And there, there have been some attempts, but basically uh, what, what is done normally in most of the codes, and this is what we do, is called adiabatic local density approximation, which is basically an uh, exchange correlation potential that is local in time. Yes, so it depends only on the present time. Uh, and the good thing about this theory is that now we have a, 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 an external potential, then we can put whatever we want there basically, and then we can couple to electromagnetic fields. Yes, so the, this, is, this is what we will want to do to couple with external fields. In order to do this, we have basically two approaches as 
Thomas also mentioned yesterday, perturbation theory, the Casida equation that he introduced yesterday, and the real-time propagation that is what we're going to focus on, yes? In order to do the real-time propagation, let me first introduce the concept of the density matrix for you. Uh, if, you're if you're not familiar with it, the density matrix is a projector, as you can see from the definition here. And this one, this density matrix in particular that we want to work with, it's called the one electron, reduced one electron density matrix, yes? Um, and it's built from, as, as the formula here in the middle says, from the Fermi occupations, for example, or any occupations of your orbital, and the eigenvectors that you get when you calculate the ground state. Yes, these, these C vectors are the coefficients of the molecular orbitals in the atomic orbital basis, which is the eigen, eigenvectors when you diagonalize your Hamiltonian. Yes, basically, we will start from the ground state and we will ask ourselves how do we propagate this electronic and nuclear state of the system in time? Yes, and uh, for that we need an equation of motion, and um, this equation of motion we can write for the wave functions, as you know, tan dependent Schrodinger equation, this is what I will show now, but we can also write it for the density matrix, so this is why I'm introducing this concept, yeah, if you have questions just interrupt at any time, or if you Charlie also want to add something, okay, <laughs> okay, so basically we start from the tan dependent Schrodinger equation, as a general term, right, it actually would be a time-dependent Consham equation with Consham orbitals within the FT B. Uh, and this Consham orbitals now could be described in the basis of the atomic orbitals. Um, and then basically the first step to, to do this, this the derivation is to consider that the atomic orbitals, that the, that the molecular orbitals, the time derivative of the molecular orbitals is basically the derivative of a product. Uh, and um, if one does that, just basically can be rewritten as here in the second line. Uh, and then, of course, as we normally do, we sandwich this formula with a stay phi kappa from the left. And then we see what, what we got. And if you, maybe this was already mentioned in the previous lectures, if you have this, these brackets here, of course, this in the FTB, we have a non-orthogonal basis. So these are the orbit, the, 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 the overlap matrix. Yes, this is the Hamiltonian matrix, and this here is something that is, of course, something new, which uh, is what we will call the non-adiabatic coupling matrix, basically, yes? So if one does a rearrangement here to, to have a formula for the derivative of the coefficients, which would be the equation of motion for the wave functions or for the coefficients, we arrive to this expression in which basically we will see that uh, uh, we can we, we, we can do the, the full dynamics if we know how this how to compute this non adiabatic coupling matrix, which as you can see depends on the time derivative of a certain orbital. Um, so in principle, one could directly use this equation and propagate it. Yes, and this is what some people have done. Also, Thomas Nichols has done it in the paper that he has. But uh, in in our case, for 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 efficiency purposes, we basically rewrite this considering the definition of the density matrix. And now we have a formula for the time derivative of the density matrix, yes? So uh, basically just, just arrange, just considering the, the definition of the density matrix that I, that I showed before, and putting the coefficients there, proper coefficients there, one arrives at this equation basically, in which, uh, we have some kind of a commutator here as the first term. This is a generalized commutator when you have non-orthogonal basis um, that would provide what, what would be the elect purely electronic terms without considering nuclear motion. And the second couple of terms here is would be an anti-commutator is uh, would, would correspond to the non-adiabatic terms because this non-adiabatic coupling matrix uh, actually can be rewritten if one works out this. I will not go into this detail, but you can see it in the in the paper that I showed before. Uh, depends on the nuclear velocities, yes, and the gradient of the overlap matrix along the direction, the internuclear ax, uh, the internuclear axis, basically, yes. So when one freezes the nuclei, so no nuclear dynamics, if we're not interested in that, Velocities are zero, this dies, this dies, and we 
uh, go back to the purely electronic term, yes? And this, this is already very useful for, for many simulations. Uh, and when we, when we need uh, to consider the nuclear motion, yes, of course, we can, we can switch on this term and also evolve the nuclei. They will acquire some velocity or they may, may have initial velocities. But then we are within the Ehrenfest approximation, which is what I will also tell later. Yeah. So, so far, so good. Also, people can recognize this equation as the Lubil von Neumann equation for a non orthogonal basis. Maybe you have seen it like that. It's directly the commutator of H and rho and the density matrix. Yeah, but uh, this commutator, commutator, which for an orthogonal basis would be directly H rho minus rho H, in this case has this s to the minus one, this inverse overlap matrix over there to account for the non-orthogonal basis, yes? So this will be our tool, basically, to propagate, numerically integrate this, this equation of motion that depends, differential equation that, that basically couples uh, the dynamics of the density matrix. Uh, and you may ask yourself, what, where, where's the electric field here? How, how does this enter now? We, 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 we are not seeing the, the, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, although this is equivalent to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, uh, but we are not seeing it. Well, of course, it's inside this Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian will also evolve in time, depending on the external perturbation that we have. We may, may be a time-dependent external perturbation. So let me, for, for a moment, ignore the the, the non adiabatic coupling terms, we will go back to that later. Basically, we keep the first term. So what do, what do we need to do in terms of numerical algorithms to, to propagate it? We need first an algorithm, typical uh, numerical integration algorithm, something that tells me at time i plus one, what is the, the object that I need based on the object at time i, basically the previous time step. And uh, among several, several options that you can use there, we always pick, we have always picked uh, this one, thanks to Christian, that uh, he always knew that it was the most efficient one and we never even tried other methods. It's called the leapfrog method. Yes, the leapfrog method basically, it's a two step method that depends on time i minus one and the derivative at time i to compute the, the density matrix at time i plus one, basically. Yes. So, um, it's, it's a very good method, it's unitary, it conserves the trace of the density matrix. Uh, and it's, it's, the, the nice thing is that you can just rewrite it as three matrix matrix multiplications, basically. Yes, considering the definition of, uh, of the time time derivative of the density matrix, one can rearrange these products in order to make what looks like one, two, three, no, one, two, three, four operations make them three into three. And basically, which is just three uh, gems, what we call gem, which is the matrix matrix multiplication subroutine. Yeah. So in, in, in essence, now we will have we will be able to get the density matrix at the next time step. What do we need to do afterwards? OK, in DFTB, we normally consider the self consistent DFTB Hamiltonian. Yes, we consider Hamiltonian that depends on the charges, as you have seen these days. Basically, now we have a new density matrix, we have a new quantum state of the system, then we have new Mulligan charges or Mulligan uh, populations uh, of the shells, basically. And we need to calculate them to include them back in the Hamiltonian at every time step. And on top of that, we may ask that this is not shown here, we may add, sorry, uh, the external potential, the external electric field. Yes, so at every time step, we have to calculate the charges at the external field, if we have a simulation with an external field, could be also free dynamics without any external field because we just started from a non-equilibrium state and we are interested in the free dynamics. Uh, and then with the new Hamiltonian, we can compute the density matrix for the next step. Yeah, basically density matrix, Mulligan charges, Hamiltonian. Also here could be the external field and then go back to the density matrix of the next time step, yes? Basically, this is the basic algorithm that we have. Um, but what, what use is this if we, it just runs all the dynamics to 20,000 time steps and we don't see anything, right? So we need an output. Yeah? We, need, we need to be able to track some properties of the system in time. And in order to do that, I mean, we have implemented several types of outputs. In general, uh, it's, it's very convenient to use the density matrix because the expectation value of any observable uh, can be computed as a trace of the density matrix times 
the operator. Yeah. So basically, this is the very well known formula for the for calculating operators with the density matrix. So in principle, we are mostly interested in the Malikan charges, which of course we sum up over all the shells, all the orbitals of each atom, and um, we we compute the the atomic charges, and then we compute the net atomic charges to see how much each each species is is populated during the dynamics which is also useful for the Hamiltonian, but it's also useful for the user to, to, to see how the dynamics is running. Uh, we also need the dipole moment for several reasons, as I will show you later. We can also compute that. We can also compute, in principle, higher orders, higher um, multiples. Um, and we are also interested sometimes in the, in the populations, but the populations in time, when you see the, 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 the populations in time, uh, there are several, I mean, the populations of which orbitals is the question because the orbitals also evolve in time basically yes so in order to have something that we can understand we project the populations in the ground state molecular orbitals yes so we have what we call the dynamical populations which are uh, projected on the ground state molecular orbitals what i show here is basically just a normal change of basis although the secret is how one computes this lambda matrix which is just the inverse of the eigenvectors matrix yes so we do we can we can do this change of this change of basis at certain times during the dynamics to have the populations of the orbitals and we can see how it, some orbitals are populated or depopulated during the dynamics which gives us information of what process or what excitation we are driving with the external field basically yes so uh, we can also print forces, the, 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 the time-dependent forces, the en different energy components and so on. So we will see that in the hands-on session. So just a, a few things about the implementation in DFTB Plus for this uh, purely electronic dynamics. It scales of, of order n cube for frozen ion dynamics. It's not so good when we include the, the ionic motion. For the moment, it's only open MP parallel. Yes. So in principle, it's not uh, not needed, uh, or yeah, we, you will not gain anything if you compile the code with MPI for this uh, for this feature. At some point, I hope soon, uh, the MPI parallelization in capons and spin channels will be added. This is, in principle, trivial with the code, or almost trivial. Yeah, I can see Balin say yes, but uh, I hope I hope that this will be done soon. Uh, and then, yeah, one could also think. Well, you say I have a, a, a huge molecule that is spin unpolarized, so I don't I don't have spin channels, I don't have capons. So I, I also need to gain from MPI parallelization. Well, this 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 maybe will take a bit a little bit more time, but in principle, this we can also do. Yeah. Uh, and, and 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 the way this is done, as I said before, we normally build the ground state density matrix and we start the dynamics from there. One could build also an excited state density matrix, or one could uh in principle, just excite manually electrons to some orbital and then run dynamics from there. But normally we just start from the ground state. So the, the way the code works is just these dynamics are called at the very end of the execution of the code. So be, after the code has done everything, anything else you have asked the code to do, whether it be single point geometry optimization or whatever, at the end, you start the, the electron dynamics, yes? So bear that in mind, if you have something written in the driver option of the input file, this will be done first. And then at the end, with the final geometry, for example, if you have done a geometry optimization, this will, this will be the one used for the dynamics. Um, and if you are interested in taking a look at the code, uh, it's there, basically, this, this path. I just added it so that you can have it in the slides later. And, uh, and a new thing is that it's interfaced with external code, uh, codes via the API. So basically, externally, you could also ask DFTB Plus to run a certain number of dynamic steps, could be also one step, and exchange information with DFTB Plus. So exchange electric fields, geometries, forces, and maybe an external code, you, you want to do something else with this. You want to use these forces to evolve the nuclei with a different propagator than the one that we have, which is velocity Verlet, or whatever. Yeah. So basically, that's that's a new feature, still not very used. It interfaces with the code that I work with now, which is Octopus, but uh, it could be interfaced with, uh, with other codes as well. There, there will be a talk about this later, I think, so this could be understood later what the API is. So basically, regarding perturbations, 
the way we couple to light at the moment is via the dipole approximation, yeah, the, the lowest order uh, approximation, which is uh, dipole coupling to the transverse electric fields, yes. Um, and basically, this electric field could be anything in principle, could have any shape in, in time, any, any sort of pulse, but we focus more on two, two types of electric fields, either uh, Dirac delta, which we call a kick, Will, will be called a, uh, the kick after this hereafter, and um, and the laser, yes? So the laser, which could be a continuous wave or a pulse, yes? So for with these two things, we can do different things. With these two, basically, pulses or shapes, we can do different types of calculations that give us different information. Let me start with the absorption spectrum. So we apply this delta kick to the, to the system, which is the delta kick, which is basically an instantaneous acceleration to all electrons of the system. And after this kick, which we don't apply exactly by a numerical, let's say, because exactly this is a delta kick, so it has no time in, in essence. So we basically have an analytical formula to apply the kick, which basically excites the density matrix instantaneously. And then we start the dynamics from this kicked density matrix. And we just propagate freely afterwards, yes? We just don't add any, any other external field um, for an, a certain number of steps, yeah? Normally it's around for, for an optical excitation with a typical time step that we use, which is around uh, 0 0.005 femtoseconds, so five attoseconds. Uh, we have to run around 20,000 steps or 10,000 steps, right? Um, of free propagation. And in this free propagation, we just compute the dipole moment, yeah, the three components of the dipole moment in time. Why is that? Because with the dipole moment, and here we apply linear response to this, which is uh, a, different form, a different form of, of linear response, we can compute also uh, the polarizability of the system, which can also be used to compute the cross section of absorption of the system, and then we have the absorption spectrum. Basically, so this is the this is the path that, that we take: kick the system, free dynamics for a certain number of steps, uh, record the dipole moment in time, do the Fourier transform of the dipole moment, and with this we can have the complex polarizability of the system, and the cross section of absorption is proportional to the imaginary part of the average of the let's say the average of the diagonal elements of the polarizability, yes? So this would be like the trace divided by three, hmm? uh, which is also, yeah, multiplied by the, by the frequency as well. Let me show you now how, how will one do that with the code. Essentially, one uses any input file that you already have for the FTV Plus, and you have the, to add this block, uh, electron dynamics uh, block. You provide the number of steps, the time step. As I said, normally this 0.2 atomic units, which is around five attoseconds is a safe time step, but sometimes one has to decrease it. You will be able to see when you have to decrease it. You will see some, some strange behavior there in the time propagation, some explosion of the, of the dynamics, and then you have to decrease it. Um, and then you also have to say which perturbation you want to apply. In this case, the perturbation is called kick. And uh, the polarization direction of the kick, which is uh, the, yeah, the polarization direction of the electric field, basically, you can say X, Y, and Z, or you can say all, basically. And you just, if you say all, it will run consecutively X, Y, and Z propagations, which for each one of them, it will record the dipole, the three components of the dipole moment in the different five, yes? So now you have three files, mu X, mu Y, mu Z, dot dot in your directory, and you can run a Python script that we have also in the tools in the FTP Plus, it's called time, time propagation spectrum which will, first of all, dump the dipole moment because we, for a molecule, the dipole moment, I mean, in, uh, in, in, in this type of electron dynamics, it doesn't have any dissipation, doesn't have any damping. So it will just be, you know, oscillating forever. So you have to dump it. Also, when you dump it, you dump it with an exponential function, which the Fourier transform of the exponential function is a Lorentzian. Basically, so you're adding a Lorentzian line shape to each peak, to each excitation in your spectrum. Uh, and you also have to provide the intensity of the electric field that you used in your input file, yes? So if you use exactly this, this number here in volts per angstrom. So you divide 
when you when you want to calculate the polarizability, you have to divide by this intensity of the external field. Mm? Um, basically, this is how it's how it's run. Charlie will also guide you with some with some examples to this. Um, and now this is a typical output of each of these stages that I was mentioned. Yes. Just to mention that um, from the previous session from yesterday, uh, this method to obtain the polarizability and then the absorption spectrum is totally analogous or it's a different method that is, you will obtain the same result as with the linear response and interference. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, this is also tested. Um, okay. So basically, as I said, you kick the density matrix and you evolve in time. You will have a, a type of moment in time that looks something like that, very, very noisy with a lot of frequencies, but depends on your system, of course. If you excite H2, you will have only one, one resonance, but uh, in, in this case, you have many. Then you dump it with this, uh, uh, with this uh, dumping constant, and you see that you basically make it zero at the end of the, of the run. Uh, and then you do the Fourier, calculate the Fourier transform, which gives you already this shape. Yeah. So this uh, is proportional. This mu of omega is proportional to the, polar, the complex polarizability. Yes. Uh, but in order to calculate the, the absorption spectrum, you still need to, to multiply by the frequencies and some other factors. And if you do that, you, you see that the, 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 the oscillator strength and the Basically, the, the intensity of absorption of each peak of each excitation changes with respect to this to this uh, polarizability only. Yes, uh, this is something relevant because some people always only talk about the polarizability when calculating the absorption spectrum, but it's actually the absorption cross section that matters. Um, yes. So for the moment, I think that's that's the introduct introduction to the kick. What can you do now with the kick uh, in the FTB plus? You can also use the spin polarized systems. In the FTB plus and apply the kick. And this is something important that we also had doubts about this for a long time. So to be honest, what was singlet and triplet in our case, and what was singlet and triplet for the Casida uh, uh, solution? And basically, we, we use uh, the same words but with a different meaning. So be careful with this. Um, the singlet excitation for us is when we apply basically an electric field kick, an electric field kick will not couple differently to the two spin channels. It just adds the same perturbation to the two spin channels. And hence, it gives you a singlet excitations. So excitations that don't have any change of spin, basically, yes? Well, we can also add a magnetic field kick, which basically is the same uh, kick that we were applying, but with the opposite sign to the two spin channels. And then propagate the dynamics. And uh, for, with, with that information, we can compute the triplet excitations which would be, sorry, there's a typo here, should be different than zero, actually equal to one. Yes, change of spin equal to one, yes. So in, in principle, with this, as we, we were listening yesterday that there's, there's no possibility of change of, of spin, so singlet to singlet, triplet to triplet, but in the case of using the real-time dynamics, there is possibility to change spin, yeah? You can excite from a singlet to a triplet because you can add the magnetic field kick. It's not as simple as to add the magnetic and magnetic field in a laser fashion or a magnetic field excitation to drive this transition. This is not implemented yet, but for the absorption spectrum, it is. Yeah, so that's clear. You can also calculate the absorption spectrum for periodic systems, but there is a, there is a catch with this. It's only for, uh, by applying the kick in non-periodic di di dimensions. We are working on the solution to the fully periodic systems. But for example, if you have an, a graphene nano ribbon like, like this one, in which here the vertical direction is the periodic di direction, and, and this, this direction is non periodic, the, the horizontal, you can apply the kick in the horizontal direction, and you can calculate something like an absorption spectrum uh, in this direction, right? Yeah. Which is what's shown here for different, you can also use different K points. You can see how this, how this um, basically. Um, uh, converges with the number of cables that you use. Then you can also use the, the models to improve the description of correlation that we have in the code, TFTB plus U or pseudo self-interaction correction. This plot is also from the same paper uh, about uh, different, so basically scanning uh, or sweeping a range of U values 
uh, and calculating the absorption spectra for all these U values and checking what would be a reasonable U value to match the transitions calculated with higher level ab initio methods, yes? So this you can also do. You can also use on-site corrections. And uh, recently we also enabled long range corrected uh, hybrid functional calculations, which I think you also already heard about, uh, but it only singlet excitations for the moment, is that right? It's available only singlet. Only singlet excitations or non-spin polarized uh, excitations at the moment. And more recently, XTV Hamiltonians have made also available uh, in the for the time propagation dynamics. So you can also start with a, an XTV Hamiltonian, get the ground state and calculate the dynamics. And uh, we're also in an exploratory phase basically of this method, but it seems to work very well. So uh, if you're interested in that, talk to Sebastian, to me or to us, and maybe we can also do some, some, some calculations about that. Of course, this is also relevant if the parameters are not available within the FTB. Okay, so this is the about the kick. Now let's go to the laser-driven dynamics. Now, as I said before, we use the same dipole coupling, but now at each time step, we will add a contribution for an external field, which could be polarized in any direction. Polarization vector is given by this uh, vector here. Then uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, an electric field amplitude, uh, this the, the carrier frequency and phase, and then we also can have an envelope function. By having different envelope functions, we can have pulses, pulses of different uh, different time or, or also different shape. Um, in principle, it's also implemented uh, circularly polarized pulses. Yes, so you can add a circularly polarized field to to the dynamics. Uh, and if you if you do that, if you if you add, for example, for this. A PDI molecule, and you use this tool that Charlie will also explain, called time prop max pole deer, to get the maximum, the direction of the maximum polarizability axis, to shine the laser aligned with the direction, with the polarization aligned with the maximum polarizability axis, and also tuned this this frequency, this omega tuned to the specific excitation of your interest, you will be able to drive the system with the laser. Yes. Basically, this will be the shape of a continuous wave laser, and this will be the, the shape in time, so basically the evolution of the dipole moment of the system. When, when, you are, when, when the excitation is tuned, exactly tuned to a resonance of the system, the dipole moment increases linearly, basically. And if it's off resonant, you will see that increases, then decays, then increases, decays, forming bits, basically, yes. And this you can do with the, in the input file using a similar input file for the kick, but now considering perturbation equal laser, then polarization direction equal to the value that you got by using the calc time probe max pole deer, yes? Uh, and the laser energy, as I said, you have to pick a specific resonance from the absorption spectrum uh, or any value that you are interested in. You, we could also have done an off resonance. And in the case, if you want to make it to run a pulse, Okay, I didn't add the input file, but basically what has to add the envelope shape, uh, the envelope shape option to the input file and say what is the time of the envelope, initial and final time. By default, the initial time is zero. So everything starts with the beginning of the dynamics and then the final time in this case is 10. So you can see in orange the pulse and you can see also in orange the dipole moment. So the dipole moment will increase now with the pulse and then will stay constant for the remainder of the dynamics. Um, so what are some of the advantages of this laser driven dynamics is now that uh, contrary to what we use for the kick that we, we use explicitly linear response there, we, we ignore completely the higher order response functions. Here we are, here the dynamics are, is correct to all orders of the external field. Yes, so we can in principle drive nonlinear processes with strong fields. We could do multi-photon absorption and we could also uh, yeah, excite some transitions with a very, very strong power. Um, the, the, the main problem when you want to use very strong lasers is the, the basis set of the FTB, yes? So basically you are limited by the description of the higher order states and the lower order states with, because of uh, high line states, sorry, and lower line states because of the, 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 the limited basis set, the minimal basis set, yeah? Uh, I can show some examples of that later, but in principle, one can 
start with a very very weak laser and then try to crank it up and see <laughs> and see how, what happens um also allows you to explore time scales and mechanisms for excited dynamics yeah dynamics in the excited uh, state which is not accessible via frequency domain picture or uh, let's say perturbation theory picture um for example um uh, some processes are uh, a charge transfer between donor acceptor complexes prototypical solar cells as charlie is working on uh hot carriers in plasmonic systems these are also secondary processes you excite something and then it decays into something else and this you can observe with the real-time dynamics also the catch here is that okay the catch here is that it should be at short times uh short times for us are within 10 and 100 femtoseconds after that uh, normally electron phonon uh, scattering starts to play a huge role electron electron thermalization is also not well described in 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 a, in, a, in any method in any dft method let's say basically because of lack of many body uh, interactions uh, unless we add of course uh, an explicit factor to account for this decay of the system a damping but this is of course normally phenomenological one could use a different method to calculate this damping time and then add it to the dynamics but this is uh, not let's say included uh, originally in the dynamics um, and of course the other advantage is that you have now an equation of motion and you have a hamiltonian you can couple to new systems new interactions you can you can start to explore models and ways of accounting for the interaction of electrons and photons electrons and phonons with uh, the same hamiltonian basically or at the same footing and this is something for me is very very interesting because you can couple to nuclear motion you can you can add metallic contacts as as alessandro was talking about yesterday you can study now transport in real time you can study the, the transients uh, involved in, in transport in real time uh, and you can also as i am working on at the moment you can also couple to maxwell's equations in real time so that you can have propagation of electromagnetic fields alongside the propagation of the electronic system yeah so in a fully coupled way so this is for me something very powerful now let's go to the now let's go to the nuclear motion part the ion motion so basically if you're familiar with excited state molecular dynamics or non-adiabatic molecular dynamics you would know that there is a variety of methods that people use to to study this uh, of course the the exact solution is normally for any system that is larger than any, a very small model is, is impossible to, to get for quantum nuclei uh, with the quantum wave functions so people approximate the quantum wave packets in different ways the important thing here is that the nuclei don't in, in quantum mechanics they don't have a classical trajectory they don't have a trajectory specified by only one point in time but they have also a width a broadening of this trajectory it has it has uh, an extension so basically you have to account for this and in, in order to do this there are several methods from multiple configurational time dependent hard tree methods ab initial multiple spawning trajectory surface hopping and then we also have NFS dynamics, which is the lowest uh, order approximation possible. Yes, uh, as you can see here in, in many of these methods, so specifically in quantum dynamic and multi trajectory methods uh, and ab initial multiple spawning, for example, you have you account for wave packets. And in the case of surface hopping and NFS, you have classical trajectories. In the case of surface hopping, then you have to do an ensemble average of these trajectories. But in the case of NFS, in NFS dynamics, you can also do an ensemble average. But the important thing is that in the, only in the case of NFS dynamics, the nuclear tra trajectory does not have to lie on a potential energy surface. The potential energy surface for the nuclei is given as a mean field for the, all the potential energy surfaces. So it's an average of the, of, of the potential energy surfaces weighted by the electronic population in each potential energy surface. So in principle you could have something unphysical like here shown in this example of a nuclear trajectory going in the middle between two potential energy surfaces that wouldn't make much physical sense but if you pick the system and if you pick the problem properly nfs dynamics can make sense as i will also tell you later and recently the, there are new methods that 
we have not yet implemented, but make use of Ehrenfest in order to uh, improve this description by doing uh, a proper ensemble average, which are called multi-trajectory Ehrenfest methods that I would talk about, yeah? Basically, for the sake of the implementation, I will describe in the implementation, I will pick Ehrenfest dynamics. And uh, probably some of you have heard about the Ehrenfest theorem, yeah? It's published in this paper by Ehrenfest. Uh, that basically says that in quantum mechanics, the expectation values follow Newton's equations or the Hamilton's equations, yes? Basically, the, the classical equations are valid or approximately valid in quantum mechanics, but um, there is a difference between the RNFS theorem and the RNFS method or the RNFS approximation. And the main difference is that when one looks at this expression for the force, what does one see? They see that it would be equal to the expectation value of the quant the derivative of the quantum operators. Yeah, the, you see, you can see that the potential is evaluated on the quantum position operator. Mm -hmm. So you first evaluate the operators, you or you basically have your yeah your operators, and then you take the expectation value. And this is what's called the RFS theorem, and this is exact. Yeah, but in principle, we do a couple of approximations. One of them is that in order to use the density matrix for this, as I said before, the observable is the trace of the density matrix times the operator. And in this case, the density matrix would be the full electronuclear density matrix, yeah? So the first approximation is to write this density matrix as a product of electron and nuclear density matrices, and then trace out all the nuclear degrees of freedom. Yeah, so we are we, we we keep only the reduced electronic density matrix. And the second approximation is that the Hamiltonian, instead of being evaluated on the uh, on the uh, position operator, is now evaluated on the classical positions. Yes. So these two these two approximations make, of course, things much different. Although the formula looks very similar, it is not similar at all. And this is, uh, this is the main difference that you have to keep in mind. RFS theorem is not the same as RFS approximation. And now for the RFS approximation, it's easier to find a recipe, a formula or a, a procedure in order to couple these forces and the nuclear dynamics driven by these forces, molecular dynamics basically, to the density matrix dynamics that I was telling you before, yeah? So in order to do that, basically, Again, let's think of a pulse. We excite a molecule with a pulse, and now we will have dynamics, of course, of the electronic system. But now at each time step, we all can also compute the forces uh, in the new electronic state. These forces we can use with a velocity Verlet propagator to uh, 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 propagate one time step of the positions. With the new positions we can use, we use the same propagator to get the new velocities. With the new velocities, now we have to calculate this non adiabatic coupling matrix that, if you remember, I told you depends on the nuclear velocities. And then this, and then, and then we use the, the leapfrog algorithm to get the new time step for the density matrix. And this is how it's all coupled, basically. Yeah, so this is the, the essence of the algorithm for, for the RFS dynamics. Uh, I didn't include here the expression of the forces, this is in the paper. It has too many terms and it would be cumbersome to explain all of them, but. Uh, if you want, we can talk about that later. Um, but basically, let me explain a little bit how you would use it in your input file. Um, so uh, essentially now, in addition to all the laser parameters that you had before, now you have to add a couple of variables, ion dynamics equal yes, basically, which by default is no. And then you can provide an initial temperature or you can provide initial velocities. Initial velocities you could get from a born Oppenheimer molecular dynamics run or from anywhere, or you could make it by hand if you want an, initial, an atom to initially be hitting your structure from, from the outside, you just add a, a velocity there, right? Uh, and if you do that and you run the dynamics, for example, for a simple benzene molecule, you can see that I put a very, very large field strength. I also made a short pulse. So the, the total energy absorbed by the system is not that high because the pulse is only 10 seconds. But if you do that, you will see that the electronic excitation makes the benzene molecule ring, basically, yeah? And this ringing is given by something that was also mentioned yesterday, that is basically 
populating antibonding orbitals. Yeah? And this happens in most of the systems that you excite, you will populate an antibonding orbital, and this will basically soften the potential energy surface along this, the atoms participating in this orbital, and they will start to move. Yeah? Basically, this would be what would be laser-driven dynamics within the RFS approach. Clearly, this is missing a lot of things, as, as I was saying before. The non-adiabatic couplings that one normally computes, for example, in surface hopping, this is not included here. This is just the evaluation of the nuclear dynamics on a new potential energy surface that is, in principle, an average of several potential energy surfaces. But if your excited state population is not so, so, so large, the average potential energy surface will really resemble the ground state one. So it will be like uh, adding, um, so propagating dynamics with the excited state forces, but on the potential energy surface that really resembles the ground state. one. And this can be also very, very use, useful, for example, for metallic systems in which you have a very large density of states. So if you have an average density, an average potential energy surface, you are likely to, to lie nearby a realistic, uh, potential energy surface, basically, yes? But for some small molecules, of course, this is not, uh, this is not correct. Uh, so one has to use it with care. Now, let me just for, for fun show you what happens if we don't include an, an electric field, but we just increase the electronic, te the initial temperature of the system. This initial temperature is, creates a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for the velocities. And if you do that, and we, you, you run the dynamics, of course, then you can also run uh, molecular dynamics with the RFS code. This is similar to the born oppenheimer molecular dynamics, so one could make the, the test of running the, the, the two types of molecular dynamics and then compare. So with the case of RFS, there is uh, an extra friction that you can have because of the nuclear motion. Now the nuclear motion can have a friction with the electrons, with the electron gas, basically, yes? Uh, which is not the case for born oppenheimer molecular dynamics. You are, there you're always on the ground state, yeah? So this is also a, a, a clever way to run molecular dynamics with the code. If you're interested, you can also track the dipole moment of the system in time, and you could calculate vibrational properties with this. Of course, in order to do that, anyone would just use the von Oppenheimer molecular dynamics because the RFS dynamics is limited by the electronic time steps, which is on the order of five attoseconds, while the molecular dynamics is on the order of 0 0.1 femtosecond or so, yeah? So it's... You could reach much longer times uh, time scales, but if you are interested in the effect of this electronic friction, uh, you could use this. Yeah, one one important thing is that Ehrenfest, the Ehrenfest method is well described. Well, it describes well the, the inelastic transfer of energy, dissipation of energy from the elect from the nuclei to the electrons. So you, if you start with a already excited nuclear system or a very a very fast uh, nuclear motion, you will create electronic excitations because of this, and this is properly described, the, the, the loss or the, the energy that is lost by the electrons to the nuclear, by the nuclear to the electrons, sorry, is, is well described, yeah? Of course, this also has limitations. Uh, just to, to, to mention a few, uh, there is no joule heating with RNFS, yeah? You, you are all familiar maybe with joule heating, you circulate the current, you heat the nuclei, there is no joule heating basically because the electrons, uh, are treated as a fluid and the, and the nuclei are not treated as fluid, they're just, qual just classical particles. Uh, this is in this, described in this paper that you can also read. In general, this inelastic dissipation from the electrons to the nuclei is wrong. As I said before, from the nuclear to the electrons is correct. Uh, and the average electronic density, as I said before, you move in an average electronic density, of course, will fail to describe any path through any conical intersection and so on. And Thomas has already published a, a case of where this, this doesn't work for this model of the retinal molecule shift base, which would be the one of the processes that is responsible for vision. And within Ehrenfest, there is, there is nothing uh, new under the sun, basically. So um, these, are, these are the limitations. Of course, it also has success cases, yes? So the success cases would be the ones that I said before, you describe a process in a, new, in a new potential energy surface. This is mostly related to ultra-fast lasers. When you use an ultra-fast laser, basically you change the, the, the potential energy surface very suddenly, and the nuclei react impulsively to the new potential energy surface, which could be, for example, softer than the initial one. And this will trigger vibrations and so on. 
yes? And we apply this for this uh, breeding of metallic nanoparticles. Uh, people have also used it for the to study the modulation of charge transfer. Charlie also has a paper on that. If you're interested, or if you make a, a, a dimer system and you study the charge transfer, this will be modulated by the nuclear motion. And, and of course, more in physics, it's used to study the stopping power of, of channeling ions in metals if you shoot very fast ions into, into a metal, yes? Uh, because as I said before, uh, the dissipation from the nuclei to the electrons is well described, yeah? Um, as, just, just to briefly mention two, two slides about the possible uses. Uh, you can study, for example, photocurrents with, uh, with and without nuclear motion and see what, what is the effect of including the nuclear motion and the transfer charge. Yes, for example, in this case, uh, what Charlie found here is that the charge decreases when you start moving the ions by about half of the of the value it got if you ignore the nuclear motion uh, with a, with a very short pulse in this uh, nano diamond was PDI or TDI? TDI PDI molecule. I cannot tell the difference. Sorry. Um, and, 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 and of course, yeah, the other example, is, as I mentioned before, this plasmon-induced vibration. Yeah, normally when I was talking about this, make, doing this project with people, they, they told me, no, no, don't try with NFS, it's not going to work because uh, all the mechanism for this process is driven by uh, a sequential, sequential steps from electron thermalization, electron phonon coupling, and then dissipation to the environment. Uh, but of course, at very, very short time scales, this could be also a, a, a mechanism that operates there in which the initial vibration is triggered by this sudden change of the potential energy surface given by the pulse, by the, by the laser. And you, if you study this with different sizes of silver nanoparticles, you can see vibrations of the radius of the nanoparticles with periods that match the ones experimentally reported. Um, and this again can be explained by the same mechanism that in the benzene ringing case. So you excite this. This what I have plot here is the difference of population for each energy. You have energies here in this uh, vertical scale. You have the density of states. Basically, you excite electrons to antibonding orbitals, and this in general softens all the bonds, and the, the, the nanoparticle starts to move. In principle, it will reach the new the new equilibrium radius and it will stay there, but now it has it has inertia. So it overshoots, it goes far away and then has to come back and then starts bringing, breathing basically, yes. Um, and something to, to do to improve this, this is again not yet done, but something that is developed by some other people in the group where I'm right now and I find it very interesting, is the multi-trajectory Ehrenfest approach, yes. So basically, as I said before, you can, um, you can improve a lot the description of the vibronic progressions of the absorption spectrum if you run an ensemble average of many, many Ehrenfest trajectories on the order of 10,000 by choosing the initial conditions from a Wigner sampling of the, the, from the ground state, yes? So basically you do a sampling of initial conditions, you have to run the dynamics and then you will be able to, to get some of the vibrational progressions. This is still to be tested for other molecules and other systems. In my, in my group, they have only tested it with H2, and I would be interested in what is the effect with, more, uh, with heavier elements because uh, they are, uh, uh, the Ehrenfest approach normally works already a bit better, and maybe this already makes the, the approximations that one has to do here easier to, 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 to do. Of course, as you can see here, the multi-trajectory Ehrenfest kick, which is the blue line in this, in this curve, does not reproduce the exact solution uh, for this particular system. So in the group, they develop other methods, conditional wave function methods that couple different trajectories, different RFS trajectories. So instead of making an ensemble average of totally independent trajectories, you make them interact and exchange information at uh, certain time steps. And this, this will already improve. So if there is any interest in developing this, we can also talk about that later. Um, up to what I've, show, what I've shown up to now, it's all included in the recipes, yeah, in the website. I should have put this slide before, but uh, now, now we, can, we can also show it and, and explore. But basically, you have already tutorials in the website for electron dynamics, laser driven kick, and RFS dynamics with this benzene example. And let me, in the last minutes that I have, 
tell you about pump probe spectroscopy because this is something really new that we want to add fully to what is offered in the code, not just as an input flag, but also all the scripts and methods that, so that people can use. Basically, if you're not familiar with pump probe uh, transient absorption spectroscopy, it's a method uh, ultra fast laser with ultra fast lasers basically to pump uh, pump the system so excite the system with a with a stronger laser and then uh, waiting cert a certain delay time and probing it normally or preferably with a white with a with a white uh, band laser yeah? so basically um, with this you can study the dynamics of the system in a few uh, let's say tens of femtoseconds or picoseconds uh, and you can then infer what are the ultra fast processes happening there. Uh, if you have a decrease of the absorption with respect to the ground state absorption, this is called, uh, this could be called a ground state bleaching or a stimulated emission. And if you have an increase of the absorption, then basically the, you are absorbing in a region in which the ground state was not absorbing. So this could be linked to an excited state absorption. This is only within the photophysics. Yeah, if we study also photochemistry, then we can have reactants and products. And it's all more messy now the reactants are consumed during the dynamics their new products form and uh, it's a whole new universe basically but uh, computationally there were a, a couple of methods that people had developed before since the 90s and these methods are really expensive for large systems because you have to compute the third order response function and then you you will also have it your, your response only at, at third order basically but it's already good enough and uh, this third order response function is a huge object that then you can directly convolute with any sequence of, uh, of, uh, of electric fields to get the transient signal. Yeah, this is, this, a lot of people have done this, Domke and, and so on. Uh, and, but but this, this, this method with scale, last time I checked, was uh, scaling with, uh, I mean, in the literature, of course, I never did it myself, uh, order n to the 16th. Yeah, so... For a for a large system, it would be 16. yes, because the yeah the, the the third order response function is a huge object. But uh, yeah, since 2013, also motivated by a paper of the group where I'm right now, I saw that uh, within DFT you could also you could also simulate transient absorption spectra with a more effective method, let's say, also cheaper. Uh, but up to that point, it was. Uh, not considering nuclear motion, now we can also incorporate the nuclear motion. So let me show you how this method would look like. You start with the molecule, in this case, zinc tetraphenylporphyrin, which is the one that I use in my, in my PhD to, to do these studies. Then you start by, as I said before, you first, it's pump probe. So you first just have to pump it with a, with a pulse. And then, then you track the dipole moment of the pump system in time, yes? So you record it, you have it in a file in your computer, everything perfect. Now you wait a certain delay time, yes, a time tau, uh, after you have pumped the system and you apply a kick, yeah, a, de a direct delta perturbation. And now you will have a second run, second trajectory in which the dipole moment of the system is the sum, or it's not the sum, it's the new dipole moment of the pumped and probed system. So you applied already the two, the two lasers, yes? So you can already tell that this is already beyond linear response. At the first sight, it looks beyond linear response. I will tell you how we go back to linear response later because we have two pulses. Linear response would have only one. But um, yeah, now, now you have a sum of the dipole moments. And now, now you would say, I want to know the, how much the system have, has absorbed because of the probe only, not, not because of the pump. The pump I don't care about already. I, know, I want to know the state of the system at the moment I kicked it. And uh, by the, the way to do this is just calculate the dipole difference, yes? So you, you subtract the orange curve with the blue curve corresponding to the same time period, yeah? Basically, this, this would be your reference run, and this would be the, the run with the, with the kick. And in this dipole difference, we have all the information that we need to calculate a transient absorption spectrum, yeah? So we take this, we calculate the Fourier transform, and we will have this, dot, this uh, dashed red line, which will be the excited state spectrum. I also show the ground state one. And this would be the absorption. Now, now, instead of absorption as a function of omega, we have absorption as a function of frequency or energy and time delay. Yes, so absorption of, as a function of omega and tau. And now, if we want to study transient absorption spectra, the way to study this is to subtract the ground state spectrum 
and then we have absorption of omega, delta absorption of omega and tau. And this is what I was showing you before when you have a decrease, it's called a ground state bleaching in this case, because it's at the energy I had pumped the system and it's uh, basically removing population from the ground state. Then if you probe it at a later time, you will have less population to excite. And this means less absorption. And this is why the delta gives you negative, yeah, something negative. Then you also have some extra positive signal that could be linked to excited state absorption, yeah? So if we do that for several times, yeah, we, we, we repeat for, for many, many, many uh, delay times, which in the computer we can, we can do arbitrarily, we can pick the, 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 time, the time shift arbitrarily, we can make a, like a map or like a, a surface uh, function, of, uh, surface plot of this, which we could also plot in, in 2D basically, like a heat map. And this is the way we compute the, the, the transient absorption basically, yes? So you, you would say, what, what, is, what is the theoretical background of doing this Fourier transform of the difference of the dipoles? This is also described in the, in the paper that I mentioned to you, mostly in the appendix, because it's a very long thing. But essentially, what one, one has is that uh, making some approximations, one can relate this difference of the, of the dipole, the dipole of the pumped and probe system minus the reference dipole of the pump system with an effective response function that now includes the information in it, includes the information of the pump. It's a pump dependent response function. So by doing that, we eliminated one huge variable in this calculation of the third order or multi or higher order response functions, because it's only dependent for this specific pump that we used. Yeah? So if a 10 femtosecond pump of certain frequency, carrier frequency, intensity, whatever, that's it. Uh, and this allows us to, to do this. Now, it also took us some time, but we found that um, in the density matrix, you know, the off-diagonal elements of the density matrix have coherences, yeah? Have already frequencies that the system is oscillating in. So basically, if you kick the system at a specific time, you will see that these coherences also show up in the absorption spectrum by mixing the real and the imaginary part of the absorption. Yeah, this may be a, a, little, a bit too too complicated to see without any equation or formula, but essentially you can imagine that before you, you, we were taking, you can imagine the complex plane, you, before we were taking only the uh, imaginary part of the polarizability to calculate the spectrum. Now, the, the this original imag imaginary time will rotate, will rotate around the complex plane, and you will have, in the imaginary part was a Lorentzian peak, then you will have a Rayleigh peak, which is the one that has kind of, uh, 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 zero where the original had the peak, then you have a minus Lorentzian, then you have a minus Rayleigh, and then you go, go back to the Lorentzian. And if you do that, basically you see a, a, a signal oscillating with the, with the frequency of the carrier, yeah, with a very, very high frequency. We're not interested in that because in the experiments, only in phase locked experiments, you can see this. Normally, the experimentalists just um, add some external vibration to the mirrors, mirrors of the optical bench just to, to, to get rid of all the, the coherences there. Uh, so basically, in order to avoid, well, for the experimentalists, it's just hitting the mirror a little bit and that's it. And for us, it's very much more costly. We have to repeat the simulation with different phases of the pump. So we basically shift the pump by different phases, and then we have to make an average of this. And there is some discussion of how many phases you need. We did this, we are chemists, so we did this empirically, in increase the number of phases, and we just, we just check when it converges. But uh, you normally with, with four, four different phases, zero pi over two, pi and three pi over two, it's enough to, to get the transient absorption spectrum to converge, yes? And the last catch of this is that basically, uh, if you do all, all that, I, that I told you, may, maybe for some systems, specifically small molecules, you will see that uh, when you are supposed to see a ground state bleaching of the signal because you excited now you will see something that actually doesn't look like a subtraction of two Lorentzians, which would be the, the transient signal, but you will see something that looks like a subtraction of two Lorentzians that are a bit shifted, yeah? And we started wondering why is that? And that's because something that, is, that we inherit from the adiabatic uh, local density approximation, the ALDA of time-dependent DFT, which is an unphysical peak shift that occurs because of the lack of memory in this exchange correlation kernel that I was telling you at the beginning of the talk. Uh, and this, this paper by, uh, I think it was uh, 
uh, Christine Eikens uh, is there in the, the DOI, is there. Uh, they, they explore this and they explore how much this is shifted by changing the uh, excited state population with respect to the total number of electrons. So if you excite a low number of electrons with respect to your total number of electrons, this peak shift can be ne negligible. And this is the good thing for us in DFT B, because in DFT or, or in higher order methods, you would not be able to, large, to reach large molecules maybe. But as we can, we can reach these large systems, uh, normally with a very, with a mild pulse or with a normal uh, laser pulse, we will not excite many electrons to the excited state. And then we will not have a very large peak shift. Yeah, so for the case of zinc tetraphenyl porphyrin, zinc TPP that I showed you before, I had no problems in a, for, my, for my PhD. They could publish the paper, so on, no one asked questions. But now when we were preparing the example, we, were cho we chose smaller molecules because they have to run fast here in the tutorial. And there we have also some, the, problems with the peak shifting. So in order to fix that or to get away with it, basically one has to bear in mind that this peak shifting occurs only when the pump is acting, basically, yes? So when the pump is over, now the peaks will not shift anymore during the dynamics. So you can make the trick or the approximation or actually plotting something different, which is the transient absorption spectrum subtracting the the absorption spectrum right after the pulse, instead of the ground state one, the one right after the pulse. Mm -hmm. You will not see the ground state bleaching there because you already bleached the signal during the pulse, but you could see also the, the excited state dynamics if there are any further processes that are happening after the, pul the pump. For example, nuclear vibrations or internal electronic reorganizations or whatever, yeah? So that's something to bear in mind. Just, just to show you that this worked, we compare with some experimental transient absorption spectra for this zinc TBP, although this was in, in solvents. So I was talking to Sebastian in order to run the simulation with solvents now and see if we could also get some further, um, more quantitative agreement. This was more, more or less qualitative. You see a ground state bleaching in the SORET band of the porphyrin, but also you see a ground state bleaching of the Q band because the Q band in this porphyrin also uses, in all porphyrins also basically has the same uh, orbitals involved as the solid band uh, for, so some of the orbitals are the same basically. Uh, and just briefly, the last one minute, let me tell you what would happen if we do a, a, a transient absorption spectra for a long time, including the nuclear motion, because we will not have time to do this in the tutorial because the simulations with the nuclear motion take more time. But essentially you would compute it and you would see you, here we are exciting in this solid band and we see the, the transient absorption signal and we see some, some fringes there. So we ask ourselves, what are these fringes? What are these oscillations? And in order to do that, you can compute the Fourier transform again, but now along the delay time axis, yeah? And now, instead of using uh, an exponential function to get a Lorentz, we just use a window function, like, uh, like the ones you use, for example, for the calculation of the infrared spectra with molecular dynamics. Yeah? And then we move this window function, and we get the, uh, the, 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 the Fourier transform along this axis, and then we will have also some signals. So now, now we have frequency and frequency in these plots, basically. Yeah? Excited frequency and vibrational or let's say lower frequency here. And we will see some spots. So how can we tell if these are vibrational or electronic uh, vibrations that's, uh, or oscillations? We can also repeat the simulation with frozen ions. And if we repeat the simulation with, with frozen ions, we see nothing there basically. So this confirms that there were vibrations. You can see these vibrations, you can understand them. I will not tell you all that because um, uh, there's no time to, to, to go deeper, but this is also published in this paper. Uh, and this is also a useful tool to see which vibrational modes are coupled to your dynamics. Of course, going to all the trouble of doing the transient absorption and the Fourier transform in order to get it, it seems a bit overkill, but sometimes uh, if you want to understand if your approximation makes sense to compare with an experiment, if you want to validate your method, you have to, you have to do this, yes? And with that, I finish, and I would like to thank you for your attention. And now we will go to the hands-on session.